Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much. We have a great conversation today, but first I want to point out that my guests are so knowledgeable and so giving in sharing that today's guest, Nicole Will, is back again to talk about the topic we had originally planned. I got confused and went off on a caring for the caregiver topic, and she rolled with it so well that I didn't even realize we (laughs) technically recorded the wrong topic until we were all done. So she's back to give us even more advice on the dynamic between families and senior living communities and their employees. So welcome back, Nicole. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, It's always fun to visit with you. Welcome back, everybody. I have a great one for you today, but then I just do say that every week, don't I? <laughs> With me is Susan Ostrowski from Reading to Connect. She's going to um, help us navigate allowing our loved ones, helping our loved ones keep reading. And we're going to also talk about why that's important. So thanks for joining me, Susan. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Awesome. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and then reading to connect and then we can dive right into our topic. Sure. So I'm a speech pathologist and I'm working with seniors um, in various settings in the in, you know, maybe I started maybe like 15 years ago. And when I started, I was quite blown away, as anybody would be who's first enters long term care and just says, whoa, (laughs) this is basically not a good way for people to live. And I saw that the activities, um, life engagement people were standing on their heads to to bring some quality of life to these settings. Um, And they were given a huge task that couldn't possibly be managed by by just a few people. Um, So, and at the same time, as I was with people, I realized that the ability to read is deeply rooted in the long-term memory of many people living with cognitive changes, but it's kind of hidden and we don't really realize it. And that our our society and, and the field also are largely ignoring and underestimating people's ability to, to read. Um, so we kind of a multidisciplinary group of ours, you know, kind of work together with families and residents completely t- taking their lead and thinking, what would they need to stimulate that and bring that abil- capacity to read, um, you know, to, to fruition so that they could continue to read? And yeah, my mom, I don't know when she stopped reading. And I I think, and you can tell me if I'm off base, but I think it's because her visual processing was so bad. But when Mm -hmm. she was in memory care, she had a friend who was always carrying around a paperback book. And I kind of assumed it was Mm -hmm. habit. I never saw her Mm -hmm. really reading. Sometimes she'd kind of flip Mm -hmm. through the pages until one day, weeks, months later, she literally was, I mean, I'm assuming she was reading. It sounded like reading. I wasn't looking over her shoulder sure. to see what if what the words on the page were was what was coming out of her mouth. But that kind of blew me yeah. away because, you know, she was pretty advanced at that point. So yeah, it was just, yeah. it was very yeah. interesting. Yeah. And it's just, it hasn't been really tapped into and explored. There's very little research out there. So there's research on like the effects of music and pets and plants and, um, aromas and things like that but not many people at all are really looking into into reading the impact of reading so so first of all um we realize that just because people can no longer read typical books newspapers and magazines does not mean that they cannot read it simply re- means they cannot read the conventional stuff that's out there and so again we explored why that was and so basically 
there's lots of things that are affected when people have dementia, such as visual processing, like you said, oculomotor control, working memory, simultaneous processing, organizational thought, all that heavy duty cognitive stuff. And it sort of buries the ability to read. So basically we thought, what if we could take the burden off of all those impacted cognitive processes to to sort of like dust them away and then would they be able to read on their own and so the way we sort of dust them away is we create the uh, text in a format that doesn't require intense um, visual processing or intense oculomotor control or organizational thought what we discovered, which is so exciting, is that it doesn't need to be dumbed down in terms of content. In fact, on the contrary, if it wasn't age appropriate, people were, gave it a thumbs down. They were not happy with it. So so the, the really exciting challenge to come to is how do you make it highly readable while at the same time fascinating and interesting and a, 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 um, a means for them to learn things. So how did, how, what was the solution? <laughs> so it's not a formula, um, but there's some basic things that are really, really helpful for many people living with dementia. Now, Jennifer, I can, I can share my screen and show an example of one of our books. Would you like me to do that while yeah, I describe great. it? Okay. Sure. And then for those of you who are just listening to the audio, you can also see um, one of the booklets on their website, which is linked in the show notes. This book says, how do you like your coffee in my <laughs> husband's mug? I'm a tea person. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. The um, So we have over 50 books. Um, we call them age and dementia friendly. Um, a lot of them, about half of them are on what we call like popular topics like this or animals and travel and sports and things. And then we have a, another sort of other kinds of books that we call culturally specific. And those deal with, like it sounds, like maybe religious topics, like maybe Jewish reflections or Pope John Paul II, um, extending out to cultural, you know, um, the Korean War, the Japanese American story, things in the last hundred years that may resonate for 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 this generation or age group in one way or another. Makes sense. So, so this is one of our. Um, yeah, we even we even just our last book is on. It's called "It's All Love." And it's gay rights and the the progression of of gay rights in the last eighty years. So that was a that's a great book that that um, we've just added to our collection. So basically, um, we have one page of text, and then uh, uh, images and Im images on every facing pages, and then a banner. So the um, the idea is that. The picture is it's it's obviously has lots of images. So that makes it inviting. It makes it less intimidating. It also gives them a rest. So if they're reading and they're expending a lot of energy, their eye gaze will go to the image to give them sort of a rest. So now they're processing in a different way while staying on topic. What we found sometimes if if there weren't images, they would read and then maybe they'd get tired and they'd look away and they'd take a break. But then when they came back, they kind of forgot what they read and it would and they wouldn't really get far. So the images are really, really important. Um, like I said, it's not a formula, but we found a few key features that matter a lot. So one of them is to separate the sentences. So you see there's a sentence and then there's space and then another sentence and then space. That, gra that spacious graphic layout gives them, um, again, they, they're experienced readers. So they know when they come to the end of a sentence and they see space, they know that usually signals a kind of pause so what our readership will often do is they'll read a sentence, they see the space, 
they pause a little and they might reread it, which is really good for them to really absorb what it means. Or they might read a sentence, go to the picture, go back to the sentence and then continue on. Or best yet, they might read a sentence and then comment and share. So it's opinions and perceptions and memories, of course, and all kinds of things come out when people um, are reading high quality text. Any questions, Jennifer? I sort of threw in a lot. No, it's really interesting. Um, the spaces help a lot because I notice when I'm tired, I have um, very strange vision. And so mm -hmm. when I'm tired, there's times when it's like my brain re reads the word incorrectly and I'll have to be like, huh? Oh, wait, I'm back up. Oh, yeah. Okay. It doesn't say abandoned. It says absolute or something similar, but different. And spaces between things like that would be kind of beneficial, you know, late in the evening at bedtime when you're reading and mm -hmm. your eyeballs are tired. You probably should just close the book anyway. <laughs> Plus, I read on my phone. <laughs> But I like all, yeah. you know, so each, for the audio people, each right-hand page, so the one that she's got displayed right now, says hot coffee, and then it's got a picture of um, a, a coffee cup on a saucer with steam coming out of it and coffee beans, and it's on really rough, like a rough wood table with a rough wood background. So mm -hmm. They're really nice pictures, and it's probably close to half of the real estate of that page so it's it's mm. definitely catches your attention but the white space between the sentences um also helps grab your attention because it's that that negative space kind of pulls your eye back over to the left to the word so that's very mm -hmm. helpful so why is it important that we help them continue to engage in reading yeah such a good idea such a good question so so many ways i could probably talk for an hour about that so <laughs> So stimulating the mind, right? That's a good thing in general, no matter how old you are. True. But if you have dementia or you're physically slowing down or you have medical complications, your physical world naturally gets smaller. And so some people feel like as we age and we get into sort of the the final stage is a terrible word, but of our lives, it's more important than ever to actually think about imagination and creativity and, and thought processes because you can't maybe go out and romp around and, you know, climb a mountain or travel or, or, you know, join an aerobics class, you know, so, so as the body becomes maybe a little more fragile, it's a really good thing if we can stimulate that imagination. Um, so reading, one of the things I do in my presentations is I pull out extracts, like if you excerpt, sorry, like if you ask somebody, if you go online and you say, why do people read just anybody? And the the comment the 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 reasons people give become so much more important when we age. So, for instance, they'll say um, to 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 forget about myself, you know, to connect with the outer world, um, to not feel so alone. You know, if you're reading about somebody who and you're reading shared experiences, well, all those things become. Um, a risk as we age, right? We can start to feel very alone. We can start to feel very closed in. We can start to feel out of touch with the with the outer world. Um, we can, you know, start to feel like, you know, very, um, like nobody understands us kind of thing. So reading can really connect us to to the outer world and life experiences and kind of draws us out of our physical space. That makes sense. So I read for enjoyment and for information and to kind of learn, this goes along with information, but to learn about like what other, you know, learn about other people. You read yeah. about, um, you know, there was a, there's arguments over, you know, whether, Certain hairstyles for, you know, ethnic hairstyles 
fit into the school dress code or, you know, that's obviously not something I have to worry about. <laughs> At least not currently. Um, you have just, very pretty hair. Oh, thank you. Um, it's, <laughs> and we probably should unshare screen so we can see each other again. <laughs> um, but just oh, to I'm learn sorry. different things. That's okay. Um, you know, it's amazing yes. how much, I mean, sometimes it's almost overwhelming. It's like you get enough push notifications about this story or this politics or this breaking news or, you know, which restaurants are opening up in Sacramento. I'm an hour north of Sacramento, an hour south of Lake Tahoe. So I kind of got a little bit of the best of both worlds in some respects. Yeah. Um, and then I, I pick and choose like what sounds interesting. And sometimes I skim an article. Sometimes I read the whole thing, but I feel like it's, you know, I, I have the Apple News app and, you know, it's got a lot of magazines. It's like, I get a lot of information. I don't know if that's good or bad. Sometimes it feels like too much. And then I go read, you know, police murder mystery book or something. <laughs> and some of it's like escapism, which kind of has mm -hmm. a bad rap, but that's really important. And you're, you're stimulating your mind. You're stimulating your thinking. You're, 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 you're entering a kind of space. I don't know, Zen space or whatever, but you're entering a little bit of an altered consciousness when you're just opening up a book. Now, it doesn't have to be fiction, but could, you know, and you're just being, you're just absorbing it. So, um, so I argue that reading becomes more important, more important than ever as we age. The other huge benefit to reading, which we did not expect or even think about when we started out on this endeavor, is yes, it connects. So, so text that's accessible connects us to things beyond our, our lives. And it also connects us to ourselves, right? Because we're, we're reading and we're thinking about, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's similar to what I experienced here, you know. So it's 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 helps with self knowledge and remembrance, which of course that becomes difficult as we get older. But the biggest thing that the thing that we didn't expect, we expected those two things, but the things we didn't expect is that accessible reading material that has lots of space and images gets people talking. And it gets people connecting with each other. So when we started when we started offering people these books, whether they're at long term care or at home with dementia, whatever setting or libraries, they would talk more to the employee or the fam or the employee, let's say. And the employee was like, I had no idea that Mrs. So-and-so did this and did that. And she's talking in ways I've never heard before because the book creates a kind of um, platform or, or a, a structure or infrastructure really for, for, for their thoughts, right? So it's, 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 it's a support for them. See then, that, if, if you've got something yeah. that you've read, that's interesting. And in the, the the book that you the booklet you shared, it talked. I read a little bit while you were chatting, and yeah. I gave a little bit of the history of coffee. Not being a coffee drinker, I find that interesting, and I wasn't aware of it. And it's like, oh, you want to tell somebody? Hey, I learned this is this might be the history of coffee. This guy might be, have been the first person to, you know, come up with the drink. And you almost want to tell anybody. Because it's interesting, you're kind of excited about it, so I can see how it would stimulate conversations, which stimulate obviously conversations. is good. Yeah, yeah, stimulate conversations. That's a great, great way to say it. And also that it doesn't matter what age we are. We love to learn new things. We love it. And and then of course they would, you know, stories come out right about their grandmother and the way they made coffee. Well, the way they made coffee. 70 years ago is a lot different than now and what kind of coffee pots and what the smell of coffee meant in their home and just it, it just expands infinitely and 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 then the best but the best part is that we so reading to connect 
produces books, but we also provide programs for long-term care, for libraries, for family caregivers, et cetera. And in the training, we talk about how if, if, if there's, you know, if you, you can have small groups or pairs of people living with dementia, each with a copy of the same book, and they're in a group and they're basically running their own reading group because there's so little reading. So they're talking about it, they're reading, they're helping each other find the page, they're sharing experiences with the employee away in the background, which is a wonderful thing for their self-esteem. And, you know, they get this organic, authentic socialization because it's book-based. Yeah. Well, and like we said, it helps stimulate a conversation. So I'm going to throw you a curveball question. And if you don't have the answer, it's okay. But I'm wondering if continuing to read as we age, especially if we're developing a cognitive disease, can the reading help us grow? Like they, you know that we can grow new new neurons. It's such a hard combination of words. Yeah. Uh, yeah. By learning new, new things that are challenging, not simple little things, but you know, like mm. some real serious learning, we can grow new neurons. Do you think that's possible with just reading? I do. <laughs> Have I hey, seen much <laughs> research? Yeah. <laughs> Have I seen much research on it? No, there isn't. Like I said, we need to do so much more research, but you get pockets of research. Like there's a Dr. Robert Williamson. He's out at Williams. He's out of um, Chicago, Rush University. And he's done a lot on, you know, really big studies about people who do cognitive exercises, reading being one of them versus those who don't. And so how does that change? So it's certainly coming out that, um, yeah, I mean, it just makes sense, right? You're, You're using your brain in a very abstract way. And that's why it just breaks my heart that, you know, just because the newspaper is too condensed and and not readable anymore and magazines and books, then all of a sudden, you know, you still can read, but all of a sudden you're not reading anymore. And that's just seems such a shame. Well, it's a good way to pass some time. Yeah. Yeah. I find if I'm not careful, I can read, you know, there's too many interesting news articles and and they're not necessarily breaking news or politics or any of that heavy blech stuff. Sometimes it's yeah. just, you know, I'll get push notifications from National Geographic and yeah. Entrepreneur. So it's like, it's I, I get a broad assortment of options and sometimes too many options sound good. And then there's the books that I'm reading and I read books for guests and it's like, oh boy, <laughs> I could be reading all day long. And, and they say it's like it's like a diet, right? So we have to in in 2024, we have to be careful of our media diet, mm-hmm. right? What's too much, what's enough and in, in the types we want because yeah, it does it it's bombarding us. But for those who don't use devices and for those who can't read typical books, you know, it it's it's I think it's just horrible. You know, that they're not using that that skill that they have. I mean, the best dementia care, right, is capitalizing on what they can do Mm -hmm. and compensating for what they can't do. And we're not doing that as a field when it comes to reading. There's not enough material out there for them. There's more of it in the last seven years I've been doing this show. So way back in the early days of the show, I talked to a gal who created this books called two lap books and i think there's three or four of them and then more recently i talked to another guest she created for her mother-in-law but it's expanded as um i talked to lots of caregivers turned creatives um yeah she created what she calls nana's books and they're similar but i think they only have one sentence so they have like a big picture on one side of the page and then like one one statement and it's supposed to help. It's similar, but it's supposed to help kind of jog some memories, some reminiscences and yeah. conversations like that. Because you could talk about the picture, the one sentence, you know, the she sent me a copy of um, Don't Mind the Puppy in My Pocket. And so it was all pictures of um, dogs and they're yeah. and they're um, 
kind of like antique photos for lack of a they're all like yes sepia tone yeah and that's the right word but they're all they're not modern at all um mm-hmm. but they're very rich and textured and they're mm-hmm. really cool she spends a no, lot of time researching the yeah. photos the photos are very very important no nana's books are absolutely beautiful and i think she has different like like minimal text moderate text more text beautiful books and the two lap books have been around a long time and those are great books that's a great yeah so there's some absolutely good stuff out there for sure and the pictures are three. really important you and the other two <laughs> no, i don't know any um, others there's well if you go on amazon you will see that often caregivers who have written books and so you just have to so if you're looking for them you just have to look and 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 kind of figure out what what would work for the the person in your care um but there's also mirador magazine m i r a d o r i think they're in canada and they do kind of a, a dementia friendly magazine so so there's definitely more out there for sure and and everybody's you know lots of people are working hard to do this right i mean you you want it to be done right though because the the content just like you and i right there's no way i'm going to read an article that i'm not really interested in after a paragraph or so you know we need to be deeply interested in it otherwise we we don't want to read it i've i've stumbled on some interesting articles i won't name the two magazines that are guilty of this but they get into such finite detail it's like okay wait wait a minute what was this article about again oh okay, you know they they get down to like granular details it's like i just yeah. need like a little more than the highlights but i don't need to know you know like the organic reason that this thought process started this organization but it's like whoo sometimes it's you know they're like fifteen thousand words and it's like that's too much for an article i gotta have a bookmark for that <laughs> yeah 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 you need a couple of sittings yeah i mean there are some online publications where they'll have the article and then and then you can click on deep reads and it goes really deeply into that topic which is great if you absolutely love the topic you know people who are passionate about it they'll that's what they want that makes so sense. that's nice yeah. so with somebody like my mom so she did enjoy reading she wasn't she liked to read like magazines and the readers digest condensed books good so she she wasn't like i read novels um I haven't read a Reader's Digest condensed book in I don't know how long, <laughs> a long, long time. And like I said, I think she stopped reading because I don't think that what she was seeing was get what, what her brain was processing. Right. So if I was to bring her one of your books um, and encourage her to, like, how would I encourage her to read without challenging and, you know, causing like a, a negative situation to determine if she was still able to? yeah that's a a very good that's a no that's an excellent question so one of the nice things about the the, well the reasons why we put in so many images is because when they open up that page when they see the page usually people's eyes will go wherever it makes sense so they'll know right so if they see the sentences and that makes sense to them they'll go for that if maybe they only can handle a little bit of words they'll go for that banner and the image and if and if they don't have much language they'll go right to the image so so generally that kind of works well because if the person if you if you present the book offer the book very gently you know here's just some you know, something I picked up, I thought you might like, I know you, you like Paris, or you remember you went to Paris, let's look at this. And you so and 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 you sort of direct them to the images, maybe. And, you know, it's funny with reading, like, like, if I said to you, um, if I said to you, don't read this, (laughs) right? Was this was this was this in the right? Yes. Like, this looks backwards to me. But, but if I put up a word and I say, "Don't read this," 
right? You can't, you have to read it. It's so automatic. And so that's kind of what happens with, with the reading material. When their eyes fall on it, if it makes sense, they will begin to read it. Now, they may struggle for certain things, but you just have to kind of take their cues. When So we have one of our programs is, is the Care Partner Program. And when someone purchases that program, they get a selection of books and video books, and they get a video training that talks, it's only half an hour, but it talks about generally the best way to present the books and how to keep them in the lead, how to let them run the show and and that you're following their lead as opposed to, you know, us kind of directing, like, do this, do that. The, the, The idea is that the person living with cognitive changes will just interact with the book in whatever way is meaningful for them. That makes sense because if you run across something that's written in French, which I did take <laughs> French in school, I actually can read French much better nice. than I can actually understand spoken French. Um, yeah. So that might not be. If I ran across something written in Russian <laughs> <laughs> and there was a pretty picture next to the text, I would definitely go for the picture. Mm-hmm. One, I'm a visual person, but two, like you said, I can't read Russian. I mean, it's interesting. The alphabet is interesting to look at visually, but I'm not going to be reading. (laughs) So that would make sense. And the reason I asked is because the more help my mom needed, the more she pushed back and started becoming aggressive with certain, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, when people insisted on helping with certain things. Yeah. And you don't want to take a nice moment of being able to share a book together and turn it into a battle so that was that was the point of that question and it makes sense that you know you wouldn't engage with something that didn't make sense so i, I like the way you worded that mm-hmm. yeah it's just to look at their cues and and sometimes if sometimes it's good we recommend just putting the book within their field of vision within their reach and letting them just take it as they wish that makes on sense their own too. time some people, so you, some people, we found they they re they they enjoy the book better alone. It's very interesting. They 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 maybe feel distracted, or they maybe feel like someone's judging them, or evaluate. You know, it's some kind of evaluation because they're not used to reading material. But then you get other people who really, really need someone beside them. I don't know, to kind of keep them focused or they want it to be a social experience. So you really have to be sensitive to that. And we talk about that in the training. That makes more, that I love that. So you want to talk a little bit about the training and what they get, we've talked a little bit about it, but you want to go into a little bit more depth with that? Because it sounds like that would be, the books are great, but the training sounds like you could really ramp up the engagement and their, their benefits. If you get, a, you know, after you listen to this, you're still going to need a little training. <laughs> so we, everything's based on Montessori principles. So Montessori for aging and dementia. And in a nutshell, that talks about three things, three elements to make an interaction successful with someone living with cognitive changes. So the three elements are environment, materials, and the the care partner interaction or um, approach. So whether so, we have trainings for long term care activity staff. We have trainings for libraries. We have trainings for care partners, individuals. So and there are three different kinds of trainings because it's three different you know very different settings and so forth. <clears throat> but the principles are the core principles are the same that. It's an, it's the Montessori approach feels like if you have an environment that's conducive and that's dementia friendly, so good lighting, quiet, good postural support, um, maybe the table is very close to them, um, you know, physically comfortable, you know, they're not looking at a window with lots of glare. There's all kinds of stuff like that, 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 that we talk about being sensitive to. So if you set up that optimally and then you give them materials that are for them, that are accessible to them, in this case, we're talking about a a book. And then if you approach it 
in kind of a gentle follow their lead approach rather than sort of a directing approach rather than like a teacher student approach. So we, we talk about that. So those three elements create um, a situation where, th- where the person can usually be as independent as possible and is in charge of their experience. They're engineering their experience because you've set up everything for them. I could have definitely benefited from learning how to let my mom take the lead because I was always trying to engage her with things and let's try this and let's do that. I was like, go, go, go. Cheerleader for let's do something fun. Oh, Lord, it never worked. (laughs) (laughs) It probably worked more than you think. It probably, you know, I'm sure. It it ended up with me discovering because my mother would have been very happy just sitting around shooting the breeze, which would have been fine if you could have a conversation with her. But, you know, she would ask you, well, what have you been up to lately? And I would answer, oh, well, you know, it's Monday. I went and did this. What have you been doing? Oh, you know, same old, same old. So it was almost like asking a yes or no question. It was like you could not pull more out of her. So it was yeah. very one-sided and, ugh, God, it was horrible. Frustrating. <laughs> so I finally, yeah, it was just, it's like I can't. You know, after 20 minutes of answering the same question and trying to like, well, what have you been up to? Did you have a good lunch? Oh, yeah. Did you guys have, was it hot? Did you have sandwiches? What did you have? Eh, you know, lunch. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's like, that's not working. So I finally discovered that the best activity for my mom was to go out to the park and watch the kids play. Oh, that is exactly what I want to do when I need that. That is it set me up with a park or a beach to watch children play. I think that's that was see that so that was great of you. That was very intuitive. And we went to the pool. We you know, I even um so a friend of mine was the um was it activity director? She was in charge of all the parks in the town where my mom's memory care community was. And they had a city park that was also a water park. So it was not mm-hmm. like these big fancy water parks. It was pretty fancy for a city owned water park. You know, it had some big tube slides and um, just different areas. I mean, you know, it was not, it was not slacking. I mean, the teenagers might not have been thrilled with it all the time, but it was, it was good for the general public. And I would take her there. One time I'm like, can I just pay like, and I'm like, we're not going in the water. I just, we're just sitting on the you know next to the grass can i just pay like a observer fee please (laughs) because just to go in and sit was a little i think it was like 10 or 15 bucks each it wasn't expensive but it was like this is kind of a lot of money for her to just sit here and watch these kids come screaming down the slide (laughs) but it was but it was totally appropriate for her Mm -hmm. that was a great that sound it sounds like it anyway that that was just stimulating enough not overwhelming right a familiar scene of children just having a ball you know that's i think that's wonderful well that's what i landed on you know assuming you know because she was a mom and a grandma i'm like well this makes sense to me (laughs) but it would have been nice to have something other than to you know um always people would ask me well what are you gonna do with your mom today we're gonna go watch kids and i'd get really funny looks i'm like wait 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 we're just, yeah, we're going to the park to watch children, but it's not what it sounds like. No, but but anybody who knows, you know, that stage of life understands that. The um, <clears throat> When a long-term care, whether it's skilled or memory care, assisted living has our program, they do find that families coming to visit just love having the books. And they love that because because it's hard for people with dementia to abstract and to talk about things without something tangible. And and pictures are nice and photo albums are and so forth. But the nice thing about a well done book is that so say the topic is um, I don't know say it's Chicago or the Korean War or whatever <clears throat> cats excuse me, cats and kittens, that top 
vocabulary around that topic is is on each page. So they keep getting that referential topic, right? They keep getting reminded of it and they keep reading and seeing the vocabulary. So that allows them to express themselves in the picture. So they end up having conversations with much more depth and spontaneity than than without the books generally. That makes sense. How does it work with libraries? Because I love that you've got training for libraries because, you know, we know that a lot of caregivers spend their own money to help, you know, care for their their families. They leave jobs to take care of families. So sometimes finances yeah. aren't always ideal. And so if you can go to the library and check out the books or, or read the books there. So you're training the librarians on how, what, do they train the people checking them out? So they, so the librarians, usually they're not, you know, dementia care professionals. So they definitely need the training. So, so they purchase a collection of books and what we call supporting materials, which are like book stands and reading screens and things like that. We train them in a two hour training of how to use the books with people living with dementia. So they can usually do three things. They can very simply just have the books out to circulate so people can come in and check them out. And usually when they check them out, they, they, there's a handout for the care partner, just some tips and you know of how to make it most successful and enjoyable. So that's the first thing. They can either just circulate the books. The second thing they can do is have a time and um, for people people living with dementia and their um, families or, or hired care partners to come in and they have an activity based on the books. So like Cinco de Mayo, you know, might be, and then they, we, they use the Latin dance book. And so there's different copy, the, there's copies of the same book. So they'll, we talk about how we really demonstrate how to have a reading group for people living with dementia. And sometimes that's really helpful because they often house a caregiver support group. So they'll have the caregivers go to their support group while the people living with dementia will be in an activity in the library. That has been a real plus. And then the third way that a library can serve the the older adult patrons of their district is to actually go to long-term care. So they'll go to a memory care or, or skilled nursing or assisted living, and they'll bring the books and they'll kind of conduct reading activities for that population right there. That's awesome. So if you go to your county library, your local library, and they don't have these books, request them. Yeah. Because this, I mean, I'm just seeing so many benefits I just know. because like I didn't think I didn't know librarians went to places like memory care or long term care. So that's different you know, librarians, but libraries, I, they're one of my I just have so much respect for them. Yeah. I mean, some of them more than others, but some of them are outreach is a big thing. They'll go into prisons. They'll go to serve the homeless. They'll go to long term care. You know, immigrants, they have these programs where they're going out. They're saying, OK, this is our district or I forget what they call it, their area, province or whatever. And who's in there and are we serving them all? I mean, it's incredible. But yeah. but but they need the skills, right? You can't just kind of run a group with people with dementia without some training. So the education piece is is big, and and we've had such positive responses from everybody, families, um, people living with dementia, and the library employees. That's amazing. I think my mom would have really loved mm. the reading group at the library. That that sounds up her alley. Uh, my yeah. dad probably wouldn't have wanted to take her, but. Um, I would have, you know, back in the day. This has been fantastic. So how do people, so it's readingtoconnect.com, which will be yeah. hot linked in the show notes. You guys all know that. Mm-hmm. Um, is there it's any reading, last? It's reading the number two right. connect.com. One word. <laughs> Always, I can picture it in my head, but then that's the, that doesn't help with, with speaking it. Is there I any know, last tidbit you want to give anybody, everybody? <clears throat> Excuse oh, me. Oh, just, you know, 
Um, so, so if you go to the website, you can see all our books, you can see sample pages, you can um, view videos of, of people using our books and, so, you know, so forth. We have an information, an information info se- session uh, once a week, and that's scheduled. You'll see that on the website. And, and of course, they can contact me anytime via the website with questions. But oh, we also have a workshop that is held quarterly. And that's just a workshop on how to create your own age and dementia friendly material for somebody in your care or somebody you love. Um, but if, if, but also I just want to say like, when you're caring for somebody or you know someone with dementia, kind of, kind of don't take, don't, let's say, don't, um, don't assume they can no longer read, you know, and if you have the time, take, take, you know, try to fiddle around with the text and see if you can find a format that works for them. That makes sense. Because it's well worth it. Yeah. One of the other things I did with my mom, I didn't do it for too long, but I downloaded a book of short stories on my iPad and they were Mm. funny and they were literally one to two pages, two being a long, long version. And I would read them to her and her other friend and they would laugh and then they'd talk about it. So it was kind of similar. And I know her care home, they would read. I was always surprised at how engaged they were when the, the staff caregiver would read to them. So. I agree. Mm. Don't assume. And just because, you know, like my mom's visual processing might have prevented her from actually processing the words and actually reading, she mm. did get benefits from being read to and in, and engaged with in that manner. So definitely. A- and also I find that sometimes people will look at a text or something and they'll say, oh, but they won't understand this. Now it usually has to be bigger and bold and more spacious, but they're like, oh, they don't, they won't understand this. And so that is like a whole thing, you know, like how much do we understand? And so we, we shouldn't sort of feel like, oh, they're not going to understand this. Therefore they won't enjoy it because many times we don't know what they're processing. How many times have I read something and I know I don't understand it fully and I'm not, I've missed a lot, but I still enjoy it. So, you know, you just have to try it. That makes sense. Well, that sounds like a great place to to end this conversation. Like you said, we could mm-hmm. probably talk for hours because we're both readers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So just give it a try. And I love that you have workshops to help pe- teach families mm-hmm. how to create their own materials. So you've got mm-hmm. all kinds of options with this one, guys. Mm-hmm. So I want to thank Susan for coming on today and sharing this valuable information and I'm just making me want to go read my novel and I got other things to do today. (laughs) Just curl up with a good book. It's so good. So positive. This is true. Well, finally it stopped raining. We've had like five days of rain. So it's nice to see some sunshine. But yeah, when it's raining, you know, just throw some logs on the fire and curl up with the golden retriever Mm -hmm. who hogs the couch and just enjoy my book. Get all those good hormones floating around. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for taking the time. I'm really, really feel privileged. Well, thank you so much. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.